him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner.
first Sunday in Advent is written in the book of the prophet Isaiah, the 64th chapter. Isaiah writes, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, and that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No one has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. You meet him who joyfully works righteousness. You, those who remember you in your ways. Behold, you were angry and we sinned. In our sins we have been a long time, and shall we be saved? We have all become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us, and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Be not so terribly angry, O Lord, and remember not your iniquity forever. Behold, please look. We are your, all your people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, 
Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a full tide on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a full tide at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the pole? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the pole to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. Maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for our end of the day.
Well, we have changed the frontal from the white of Christ the King to the blue of that. The wreath is hung in its normal spot with the four candles prepared to guide our footsteps towards Bethlehem. The old familiar hymns of Advent sound forth from the pipes even as the sounds of Christmas fill our ears everywhere but here at church. And the traditional gospel reading for this first Sunday in Advent, the Palm Sunday account, is again read. This Advent season begins at a time unlike any other that I think any of us have ever Sickness abounds. And I can say with some certainty that everyone sitting here in this room this morning knows someone who has gotten ill from COVID-19. Again, like several months ago, many of our hospitals are nearing capacity in their ICUs and their COVID wards. Social distancing has become the norm, along with face masks pretty much every time we step outside of our homes. Attempt to walk into a store without a mask, and you may very quickly be asked to leave. Or if you are able to get by the greeter with your maskless face, you will definitely be met with frowns and disgust, not well hidden by the mask of the givers. Many are still out of work. Reports of rising suicide numbers are coming out of our local mental health facilities. Isolation of that. Especially for those living in nursing homes and other care facilities who may not have been able to have much contact with their loved one since the middle of March. You know, we could go on and on. We could spend the whole morning doing this. And unlike Martin Luther in many of his own sermons, I will stop here and not go on for another five minutes or so. But you might be wondering, Pastor, why bring up the obvious this morning? We all know that we live in a messed up world, a world that is ravaged by the effects of not only original sin given to us by Adam and Eve, but our own sins that we have committed. In what is supposed to be the holiest, jolliest time of the year, brought about by endless family gatherings, plenty of gifts piled underneath the tree, and endless glasses of eggnog, the unbeliever and believer alike face the stark reality of empty guest rooms. And the assistance of rum aided eggnog to lift the spirits, unable even to do that this year. But as believers, we know the reality is we don't deserve anything good. Not the family and friends that we have. things that we can order off of Amazon every day. Think of a bus. For the goodness that is a God. The only thing that we actually deserve is God's wrath and condemnation. Over these last couple of months, I've been using a prayer book written by a man named Stark. It was written back early, early on, and he 
wrote a prayer at the time, a play, which I've been using off and on during these last few weeks. And there is one line in his prayer that has always struck me as difficult to read. Basically, the line goes like this, that we are the ones who must confess that it is our fault that the world is the way it is. It rubs us the wrong way. We don't want to be blamed. But when we honestly look at ourselves, we see many of the things that have happened in the world, in our homes, in our relationships, in our work, elsewhere. There really is no one else to blame except ourselves. Like David, our sins have caused a much wider path of destruction than we could ever realize. A little tryst with Bathsheba, you would have thought, would have just stayed between David and Bathsheba. And yet we look at everything that happens there. The death of her husband Uriah. The bringing in of David's commanders and plotting out how Uriah was going to die. The servants that were instructed to keep everything hush-hush and had to lie to others. David's path of destruction with his sin is broad. So are ours. And so this morning we come before our Lord repenting of all of our sins. Of the thoughts, the words, and deeds that we have not built upon the firm foundation of Christ. They're like the chaff that is blown about by the winds of the world. As children of the Heavenly Father, we seek His mercy for ourselves and for the world. And so, a few minutes ago, our voices sang that refrain of the broken, the undeserving, those who are living under the weight of the sin of this world. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. And he does. The mercy of Christ is not given chiefly in a wonderful time of the year. A time devoid of sadness or heartache, but in forgiving your sins. For that's what Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem on the back of that colt was all about. It was all about forgiveness. Some of the crowds that cried out on that Palm Sunday, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, may have well found themselves disappointed when Jesus did not overthrow Pontius Pilate or Herod later that week. But instead, suffered under the weight of their lashes and their sentence of death. They were free from their sins nonetheless. So are you. Jesus may not have made things better in the way that we expect, in the ways that we so often want, but Jesus' humble death on the cross has opened the way of heaven to you. That on Good Friday, Jesus dealt with your sins, with your heartache, with your loneliness, with the sicknesses of this world. And there at the cross, Jesus faced off with the devil, with the world, and your old Adam, subjecting himself to to these only to defeat them in his death and resurrection. 
And so you are free. You're forgiven. You're righteous. And that is the most important thing. Jesus entered into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, humbly saved, riding in to save the world by dying on the cross. We have to remember that world in the first century really was not that much different than it is today. World with political discord, aging parents who are left to fend for themselves by their greedy sons and daughters, the world plagued by divorce, where sickness and death abound. Today, today Jesus does the very same thing. He comes among us. We cry out just like the crowd did that day. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But he doesn't come riding into church on the back of a donkey. But in, with, and under the means just as plain and simple as bread and wine. When he comes into our world again, that is broken where he enters into our broken lives and gives us himself to forgive our sins. Where there is forgiveness, you've also been promised life and salvation. You have his word on it. Because God has taken it. And in spite of what we see with our eyes, what we hear with our ears, faith hold a firm grasp on God and his promises. Just like our forefathers who lived through plagues and famines and fires and floods, Jesus gave them and he gives us strength for today and hope for tomorrow. Strength to love our neighbors, to put the best construction on everything, and to humbly bring Jesus to those we know in our own words and deeds. Until Jesus comes again on the last day, the world's always going to be a messy place. There's going to be something else that happens. There are men who will be glad that the lights are turned off when we sing Silent Night on Christmas Eve. There are always going to be children who have to shoulder adult-sized problems. They're going to be new play. But through it all, faith, hope, and love look to Jesus. Until that day, Jesus will not come humbly mounted on a donkey, wearing bread and wine, but riding on a cloud in all of his majestic glory, when faith and hope will be no more, and only love will remain. Believe it, for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and protect your heart and mind in true faith in the life everlasting. Amen. And now I invite you to please rise as we continue with the prayers of the church. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For unashamed hope in the Lord's return. To sustain by his Holy Spirit, we may have joy at the advent of Christ our Savior. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. To 
the church as she enters another church year. That God would enrich his saints in every way. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Matthew Harrison, our synodical president. For David Meyer, our district president. For Barry Mueller, our circuit visitor. And all pastors in Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For husbands and wives, that they would live in love and service to each other. For fathers and mothers, that they would bring up their children in the fear and instruction of the Lord. And for all children, that honoring their parents, they would be well equipped for service to their neighbors in this life. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all Christians, that called into the fellowship of God's Son, we would be sustained in our hope as we await the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our governing authorities, that peace and order would be preserved in our nation. For Donald, our president, Gretchen, our governor, our military and police, all other civil servants, as well as all newly elected officials, and for a spirit of unity and cooperation among the people of our land and the nations of the world, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in any danger, trouble, sickness, or need, especially Roger, Jackie, Michael, Fred, Hilda, Tammy, Jennifer, Agnes, Jeff, Suzanne, Vicki, Eric, Larry, and Peggy. For an end to the pandemic, and for those who mourn that they would hope confidently in the resurrection, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For worthy reception of Christ's body and blood, that as he once was received humbly in Jerusalem through the cries of Hosanna, so we may receive him according to his promises, for the forgiveness of our sins, and in the unity of a true confession. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands, Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In your boundless mercy, you sent your servant John the Baptist to proclaim that in Christ the kingdom of heaven draws near. With thankful hearts we pray, come, Lord Jesus, confident that in his body and blood given us to eat and drink, we receive the forgiveness of sins, and so proclaim his death until he comes again in glory. Hear us as we pray in his name, and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Uh, Amen.
if Christ has given for you.
You have given us the foretaste of the feast to come and the holy supper of your Son, body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.
at 1045-ish, somewhere around there as well. And of course, our midweek Advent services start up after dinner on Wednesday at 7 o'clock. We're going to be going through some of the places of Advent. We're going to be looking at Jerusalem, and we're going to talk about Nazareth and hear about that. And of course, on that last Wednesday, we'll also be hearing about that lineup and the significance of that for this time of year as well. And next weekend, it will look a little bit more like Christmas, because we're going to be setting up the Christmas tree on Saturday. Um, any of you who can come and give us a hand with that, that would be greatly appreciated. And then Sunday after church, we'll set aside Bible class for another week, um, and then we'll be doing some decorating of the church and the sanctuary as well, and so we hope that you can stick around for that next Sunday. Anything else this morning? Awesome. Christ is risen! He is risen!